<clears throat> the following interview was conducted with Billy R. Baumgart, Professor Emeritus of Animal Sciences for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on November 4th, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Professor Baumgart, and thank you and welcome. Start by telling us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay. I was born here in Tippecanoe County in Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, interesting thing that uh, my wife and I have fun with. Uh, she's also from this area. We were born in Lafayette Home Hospital four days apart and our mothers met at that time. So we often wait and tell that story after people have said when they first met or how far back they go. <laughs> and then we say, well, can you top this? So, uh, Not many can. <laughs> right. Uh, so I was born here in Lafayette, uh, very meager means. What year yes. were you born in? I was born in 1933. Okay. Uh, January 17th. No, I was born in, nine, in January 21st of that year. Uh, and we actually didn't meet until high school days, but uh, that's, I was kind of on the edge of the county school system and the town school system. So I came in town, went to St. James Lutheran grade school, uh, and then decided to go to Shadeland High School when there were all the different uh, township schools here in Tippecanoe County were 13 at one time as I recall wow. but then that's where we where we really met but was raised uh, actually born in the city but then raised uh, on a little I call it a 4-H farm because uh, really it was just big enough to accommodate my 4-H animal projects and Which did your father farm uh, just part-time while okay. he worked uh, in town. He worked largely in West Lafayette, which really became a real help to me because I spent a lot of time over in the place where he worked after school and so on and got to meet a lot of the people that were did professors. Did he work for the university? No. Oh, okay. Not. But he was in this vicinity. In this vicinity. Geographically, he was in this vicinity, right? Good. It, in, the, in the business that was in the spot where Chipotle uh, restaurant is located right now. That's the top of State Street Hill, researchers. <laughs> right, right, the top of State Street Hill. Yeah. Right. Well, well, tell us about high school. Any clubs and things that you were involved in? And how large was the school the, then? The school was very small. Uh, my wife and I were, like I say, in this class, and there were 23 in our graduating class, but that's the largest that ever graduated from Salem High School. Oh. It, it wasn't in existence all that long because of various reasons, but... Uh, and then they started consolidation, so uh, that turned out to be the largest one that ever graduated <laughs> from there. So, and I came from there to, to Purdue right away. How did, did, you, did you think of going elsewhere, or were you were maybe more interested in agriculture, probably? Really, there forage. wasn't much discussion about going elsewhere because uh, finances. I knew I'd have to pay my own way, and I'd been really... I guess I knew almost all along I was going to go to Purdue. Sure. Uh, I knew that would be a way to improve myself in a lot of ways, but including financially, from get out of the uh, situation of being poor all my life, maybe. And it did that to some extent, but more importantly, it of course opened up all these other wonderful opportunities. But I, it, Purdue was kind of the just the place of choice. I had high school teachers and so on that encouraged me to go into engineering and really pressured me to. And I just kept saying, no, 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 I want to go into agriculture. And they said, well, at least then do agriculture engineering. And I said, no, no, no. Did I they wanted. even have that at that time? Yes, at Purdue okay. had ag agricultural engineering was huh. certainly an area, right? And uh, But I wanted to go into to the animal area, dairy or animal sciences and okay. that's what I did. What about student clubs and did you live on campus or did you live at home? I uh, lived at home for one year and if I may even back up a bit sure. and talk about I said about living on out in the country and on this 4-H farm uh, that really had a lot to do with my uh, decisions about going to college. I kind of hinted at that perhaps but it was very strong and I had my first Purdue ties that way, which I think are kind of interesting. Uh, the very probably first Purdue tie I had, connection link I had, uh, was when I had my first 4-H club ever. Which was held here at Purdue? Well, probably. I had my, at, at MR, on our little farmette, I had this cap I was trading to be able to show in to uh, county fair and so on. 
and my father, we had never done that before, and nobody knew how to show me how to exhibit an animal. And, but he had this friend, Jimmy Hilton, a professor here at Purdue, and he came out one Sunday morning and spent the whole morning showing me how to do that. Coincidentally, this Jimmy Hilton went from being a professor in extension here at Purdue to North Carolina State University as department head, and then was ultimately president of, in, of Iowa State University for many years. So my first contact with Purdue was someone who went on to be that. Isn't that nice? And my first 4-H club agent was Hobart Jones, who is a professor retired from Purdue here. And my next 4-H club agent in Tippecanoe County was Charlie Barnhart, also Purdue graduate who went on to be Dean of Agriculture at the University of Kentucky. So I met some Purdue professors sure early did. on. They got you going. Right, right, right. So, um, then he came to Purdue and were, uh, was doc, Dr. Butts would not have been here at that time, was he or not? Uh, people? He, he was, okay. uh, and but both Dr. Butts and Dr. Parlberg oh, were in yeah. Washington, uh, in and out, and a lot of that the time while I was here, I Don, was here. As a, that's Don Parlberg, right? Yes, Don Parlberg. Right, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I got to know them, but not that well sure. as I did some other people like Lowell Harden, right. very well known. Lowell was, uh, had him for several classes and, right. and so on. And your classes were in the, what's known as the Ag Administration Building today? Was that where your classes were held? Well, they were all oh. over the campus. Oh, were they? Okay. Even the the ag uh, courses would have been in in several different sure. several different buildings. Okay. Uh, including uh, the ag hall, now Fendler Hall. Right. Uh, several. That was a major classroom building at that yeah. time, and then others around there, but scattered all over campus, sure. like most students. Let me ask you: this ROTC existed? Did you have to take ROTC? Yes, I did. I was okay. in ROTC for two years. Okay. Uh, but one thing that came into play there again is that uh, Elaine, oh, my wife and I, were married after my freshman year at age 19. And She uh, also was coming to Purdue, right? She did not go to, to, oh, okay. to school here. Okay. Uh, she chose not to. She thought of something about going to IU uh, in education, perhaps, but decided in the end not to. And then we got married, and, and uh, as they say, the rest is history. But we did start having a family a couple years after that. Sure. And, and Where'd you uh, live on campus then? Was married student housing? At the we lived, our very first one was in a small private uh, apartment uh, on West Lutz Street here in West Lafayette. But then we moved to the barracks apartments, which were still out on Airport Road at that oh, time. I've heard about those, right. Yeah, and uh, we lived in those, and uh, without those and some other scholarship money, still would not have been able, sure. and working, I worked about three jobs too at that sure. time, to be able to support family right. and, and go to school. So okay. that's where we lived. Okay, and then uh, after graduation, what came next then? Okay. Tell us about that. I had fully intended to go perhaps and be a dairy herd manager for some larger operation, something of that sort. But a professor, uh, Don Hill, uh, specifically, a lot of others, but especially Don Hill, was very influential in gently leading me, and I didn't even know I was being led, into thinking about doing research and going to graduate school. So I was taking uh, quite a few graduate level courses for graduate credit in my senior year, including most of my biochemistry was already out of the way in my senior year. So I stayed here and got my master's degree in one year. And then That's they, pretty good. Mm -hmm. And they persuaded me that, well, you, I about went to work for a bank at that time as a farm loan agent, farm management agent, and here in Lafayette. Uh, but they persuaded me I really should go on for a PhD, but I should do it someplace else. I should not stay at the same university all the time. So uh, uh, was about to go to Iowa State University, which would have been great, where a well-known institution. In fact, I would have come full circle and run into Jimmy Hilton again at that time. But before I really got that uh, move made, uh, one of the professors came in, professors here at Purdue came into the lab one day and says, hey Bill, here's a notice you ought to take a look at. There's a job opening at Rutgers University for someone to teach in dairy science and coach the judging team, and I'd been on the judging team here, and uh, be able to get a degree in some other area while they're doing that. I said, that sounds interesting. Where is Rutgers? Not knowing it was in New Jersey. 
and uh, not knowing that I someday would have two grandsons who graduated from Rutgers University also. But I went there and in three years got my PhD degree in ag biochemistry or nutrition while teaching four courses full time in the dairy science department. So what the family think, didn't see you, much of me during those three years. How did you like Rutgers? How did you like? Of course, it's changed a lot over the years. You know, yes, but we we've, we've kept in touch. Uh, right. Rutgers, I have an extremely high regard for, and their interest in students is very strong, as is Purdue's. Uh, but they had been organized until very recently in clusters of colleges, right. and in that with way, with professional they, schools. Uh, well, of. more just uh, some affiliation with a direction like. When I was there, it was just agricultural and environmental sciences. Okay. Then it became known as Cook College. But a, a living environment and everything else in that one geographic area, even though the students would go on to the main campus downtown for various sure. courses, but they had a more of a home and a small environment in which to get to know people and work, and it was very successful for them. Uh, no, we have a very high regard for Rutgers. It was certainly very good to us. Sure. And uh, was very important. In right. My, in my I want to back off these on for the researchers. You were the Purdue Dairy Cattle judging team. You won third place back back then when you That's were That's correct. That's very nice. Right. We were and I, there's a picture in a paper article, and you're in the paper. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's very good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now you got your PhD. What, yes. What's going to come on? Yeah, they fully <laughs> expected me to stay there. There was you had a pretty kind heavy of the, teaching uh, load, right? Though, didn't kind you? of the uh, uh, almost understanding, although there was nothing at all in writing. And I had a chat with the department head, uh, more than chat. I really sat down and talked to us. I don't want to, you know, not be loyal or whatever. And I was really appointed as assistant professor there for a few months, about three months. But then I said, I would like to test the waters at this time, make sure I'm, I'm happy, you're happy, and we'll see what goes on from there. Well, in the end, uh, University of Wisconsin and University of Illinois both decided they wanted me pretty bad, I guess. And, and uh, I'd always loved Wisconsin, both as a state, and the dairy interest, of course. Sure. And, oh, yeah. And uh, so I chose to go to the University of Wisconsin-Madison as my first post, well, essentially first post-PhD mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. And I served there for eight years at, at Madison. Did you get uh, promoted while you were up there? Yes, I was promoted oh, from assistant professor to associate professor. Uh, went there in 59 and then in uh, 64 was promoted to associate professor okay. and uh, stayed there until 67. When, you, when right. I moved to Penn State University. How did uh, that come about? Well, had no idea I wanted to go anyplace else. Certainly felt I wanted to stay at Madison Things all my life. Things always work out for the best, right? Right, right. And my wife and I talked about it and decided, gee, we're just so happy. Can we be that happy for another 40 years or whatever? And maybe we can spread some of the things that we feel we've learned here. And we so did enjoy our time there and had such great mentors and other professors. It's a good location up there too, you know, the lake. I've been, yes. I visited there some years ago. Right. Yeah. I love Madison. Yeah, yeah. That's my favorite place to live. Whereas Elaine's favorite place to ever lived was State College, Pennsylvania, but that's all right. <laughs> uh, in the end, uh, after some, you know, typical recruitment, I did decide to go to Penn State. And it was interesting in the sense that I'd been here in Derry and at Rutgers at Dairy, Wisconsin and Dairy, separate from the other animal species and separate departments in that day and age and in those locations. Uh, at Penn State, uh, I really went into the animal sciences department, not into dairy. Dairy was a separate area. So I way left dairy, and uh, within three years, the head of the department became director of extension and again, head of the animal science, did you talk about? Yes, okay. head of animal science became yeah. director of extension, and uh, somehow or another, I ended up being department head of animal sciences in 1970, mm -hmm. and then in 1975, they merged dairy and animal sciences, and they say I was a logical choice. At least they selected me to lead that new joint department, since I had at Roots and Dairy and and then back with the animal science. So I was head of the animal sciences department then from from 1975 until 79 right. when I moved into the dean's office for a very short period of time before coming back to Purdue. Right. What, um, 
Uh, how large was the department, and what sort of were you involved in uh, recruitment? And yeah, S certainly was. There were must have been about, and I'm not remembering exactly now, sure. but about 25 professors in the animal sciences department, uh, and a very s the largest research strength had been nutrition because at one time they'd merged an institute of nutrition that goes back to some very famous people in that field with animal husbandry to form that animal science department. And I think that's really why they wanted me, is that I was a nutritionist and I helped sure. bring that group together in that way. But um, I, was, I was just going to ask about that, and then the, you tell us a little about the associate director, you weren't there too long before that's you... That's correct, and I just a you very have short the, period of time. Uh, exper an experiment station, and you were the associate dean for research. Right, right. Okay. right. It was kind of one step below what I ended up moving into right. here at Purdue, and then uh, uh, Bernie Lisko, who was dean of agriculture at that time, uh, contacted, contacted me, right, along with a lot of people, and, and uh, I was finally decided, yes, it would be nice to be back in this area and, sure. and to be full director as a, rather than associate director of ag research. And at that time, we really called them the Ag Experiment Station. That was, that, that, that had a, a lot of people didn't know what Ag Experiment Station meant. Uh, they thought, okay, where is that farm? And really, it was the total ag research program. So I don't recall exactly what year now, but sometime in those early years I was back here, the decision was made to change the name from Ag Experiment Station to Agricultural Research Programs. So, Let me ask you this then, when you talk about cooperative extension, that, that's separate though. That is separate, right. And I think for the researchers, they say, well, what about that term? Right. You might clarify that. In, in land-grant uh, system, which certainly Purdue is a land-grant university, uh, and part of the start of that uh, at being land grant was agriculture was one of the key components. And the first element of a land grant university when they were started in agriculture was the teaching element. Mm -hmm. And then they very soon decided it was tough to teach if you didn't have new information coming along, something new to teach other than just how to plow or how to do this. Sure. So they created then the uh, in the ag experiment stations to do research and as they started to be productive and find new things uh, such as say new corn varieties before hybrids but then especially hybrids uh, they would go out and the researchers would teach farmers how to do the, how to apply these things and then that kind of started detracting from their time to do research and plus they needed people who really knew better how to communicate with the farmers and others so the, the Cooperative Extension Service was started as the outreach program, as we might say today. So they were started in that sequence, but all to make this continuum there of discovery through the classroom, but also then out into right. the Right, get the engagement user. right rolling there. Right. Very good. Right. That, that's very good. Well, let's talk a bit about your uh, Director of Office of Agricultural Research, uh, in your own words. Okay, here at Purdue. Yeah. Uh, Did you replace, was it a new position or have, was it in existence when you came? It was, no, it was, oh. it was a long-term, long-time okay. position, long-time position. And Bertie Liska had held it and then he became dean. Okay. He followed Richard Coles okay. as dean. As dean, okay. And uh, then, so I really replaced him. He, sure. re he recruited me, I guess you might say, to, right. to fill that, uh, that role. So it wasn't, it wasn't a new position. And in that role, I guess I often described it as being the cheerleader and, and bird dog for the faculty, uh, trying to help them identify sources of funding for doing research, sources of other people, other expertise to be able to work with them in a synergistic way to make their, uh, their research activities more productive. Uh, because during this time, this would have been came in about eighty. Came in nineteen eighty, right, yeah. right. And at that time, uh, Purdue already had a awful lot of their research dollars, ag research program dollars, tied up into salaries, uh, more so than at Penn State, where I worked. Penn State still was more of the traditional 
if I use that term, I guess, ag experiment station, where they not only funded part of the salary of some faculty specifically to do research, but also was able to provide some support money to actually conduct that research. But Purdue had started down the road already of taking more and more of their dollars and putting them into faculty and expanding the number of faculty. And so that trend continued, and therefore I was really in that role at a time when that transition was taking place. And it was a tough time in the sense that many faculty were accustomed to being able to come to the Ag Experiment Station Director or Ag Research Programs Director and request funds and be able to get funds to start a new project. Well, due to this other switch of putting those dollars in the faculty, there were very little dollars okay. left to actually support research and less and less all the time. And that was that a tension that I had to struggle with during that, uh, actually during all the many years. Right. And that led to the role becoming more of the cheerleader and the right. bird dog to find the uh, sources of funding elsewhere and help them uh, kind of change their attitudes about what their role was. And, and they, what the threads and the changes that were coming along. That's right. All right. That's right. Was how USDA, uh, they had a lot of grants, didn't they, to help with the funding? Yes, USDA certainly has been intimately involved in funding and programs with land grant agriculture sure. systems from from day one. And uh, land grant colleges, you know, were were started in 1862. So, uh, how's the funding today versus say maybe in the 80s from USDA? Uh, as certainly as certainly larger, but not. It hasn't grown that much in terms of the USDA component of it okay. or the state component. It's grown more from outside grants, if you want to put it that way, sure. maybe other granting agencies, NIH, NSF, and then a lot of commercial uh, grants uh, from companies for, right. for research. Uh, that leads to, when you think of another interesting and complex situation that we tried to work with uh, in my office there, and that is helping people get funding, and also Purdue has a great history of being very protective of the public interest, not selling our soul to any company, not doing something uh, that any way a company could have any influence on. Right. So every research grant that was ever written here, to the best of my knowledge, uh, we always required that the the faculty member controlled the direction of the research. The faculty member uh, was able to publish whatever the results were, regardless of whether it was for a product, if that company produced a product, or, or against it in terms of how the results came out. And that was very important. But the, f the sources of funding do influence the direction of the research, what kinds of research you will do. Sure. But I don't think they determine the outcome of the research. It's the integrity of the scientist and the system and the contracts you put together to make sure that is protected up right. front. And a lot of my time was spent negotiating some fairly major contracts and agreements to, as biotech came along and some bigger sources of money started to flow, but also a lot more uh, complicated things came along in terms of yeah. companies wanting ownership of things and we simply refused to, right. to allow What about them. patents? How did, did you get many in your tent? Did they get quite a few patents? Uh, some. Never enough. Okay, right. <laughs> but and again, we had to That's work a long some drawn to out process. right, and we had to change attitudes there. Um, and there's still a good debate. And it's a healthy debate of what should or should not be patented. Uh, but I believe consensus would say that it's important for a university to patent as many things as they can, uh, even if they make them available to the public at no added cost. Because if the university doesn't patent it, and somebody else in a company, let's say, takes that same technology, does a few more steps to it, they can then patent it, and then it's locked in there. Whereas the university patents in the first place, they have control of where and how it can be used. I certainly don't remember the number of patents. It, right. it, it increased markedly during that time I as we helped to change uh, faculty's attitudes and get more disclosures, which is the first step in a patent and licensing right, process, yeah. and, right. and move that forward. Uh, an associate dean, was that just part of the title that came as the director, or was That's it really correct. two parts? That's so? correct. Oh. Uh, it was just part of the title, okay. and that reminds me that I perhaps didn't do a good job of answering your question earlier about 
uh, extension, but uh, each of the uh, directors or leaders of the other areas, uh, other areas being extension, as you said. Right. So uh, during most of my time here, my counterpart was Hank Wadsworth, who was associate dean and director of, of, of extension service. Right. Uh, and so each of the other areas, extension research, the academic programs, and then international programs, each of those persons led that area, but they all, we were all associate deans. Okay. Okay, yeah. okay, right. sounds good. Uh, did you want to make, uh, you were affiliated somewhat with the Animal Science Department. Uh, yeah, that's your right. The, uh, the, any comment uh, on that? <clears throat> I feel that I didn't do them justice, uh, but the university system, the the university system uh, uh, requires, by and large, that someone have a, a tenure track home or an academic home, and at least in the era in which I came. And my tenured home was in animal sciences. And I believe I had to be, quote, voted on at that time to be accepted as a tenured member of the faculty, although I never taught a course here at Purdue in animal sciences, other than what I did during my one year as a graduate student many years ago. But So that's why I say I don't feel I, I right. really paid them my uh, just dues. But they when, were certainly, you know, very, very kind in, and helpful to in me. In your role in the agriculture as director of that, that how does that impact on your research? You just don't. Yeah, I, during that time in that era, I did not continue to do research. Well, I was I was really a full time administrator, oh, yeah. right. and uh, I, times have changed some there, and I, I I can see that. For example, at the moment in history, as we're talking here now, there were between directors of agricultural research. The one who had been in there is now dean at Oregon State University, and they're in the search process for a, a new uh, director of agricultural research. And one of the, the pe persons filling in primarily is Mark Hermitson, who is, uh, had been head of biochemistry for some time and professor of biochemistry before that. And Mark, during all of his time as head of the biochemistry department, even while he was, uh, this is the second time he's been in an interim role in the Ag Research Program's office, has continued to do research. That's more common now. Department heads, it's more common for department heads to continue doing some research today than it was when I was in that role quite right. a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, especially in the animal and dairy sciences, there's a whole population out there in the countryside who want to see the person who is head of that department. And you are um, essentially traveling almost every night to some part of your state making contacts with sure. uh, some of your constituents. That's so to speak. right, very yeah. key, very yeah. key. Right. Um, we're talking about animal science and I just wanted to, uh, for the researchers, the, the uh, Purdue Retirees Association has an annual award, the Arthur G. Hansen Award, and in 2005, the animal science was the winner, and one of the letters of nomination was written by you, mm -hmm. and that's very nice. It, it, uh, it, it was a, a good program. The, it's right. due. The, I, think, I believe that was the first year the award was given. I think you're right. Uh, right. And the credit for that really goes to Truman Martin, professor of animal sciences emeritus, and uh, we happened to live almost as neighbors in, in the present environment. And Truman had the idea, uh, started the paperwork, did most of the hard work on it, and asked a few of us to help read the final document and write letters of support. And that was fun to do, an obvious thing to do, and uh, because that was based on what, how the department cooperated with and supported their retirees, interacted with them, kept them involved. And the Animal Sciences Department has been superb at that. Yeah, yeah. that's really good. Faculty fellow, were you a fact fellow at any time? I was not. Okay. I was okay. not. That program is a good program. It was yeah. a good program. Yeah. My son benefited from it when he was here <laughs> in school as, a, as an undergraduate. Uh, but, yeah. Let's talk about a few of your awards. One is the American Dairy Science Association Distinguished Service Award. Yes, I, I was very fortunate. I was but involved very with active several. In that. I had been. Uh, was with several professional societies, but the one that I really probably spent my most energy on was the American Dairy Science Association. And early on it received, when I was still doing research, that would have been the Wisconsin Penn State days primarily, uh, did receive their research, uh, their nutrition research award. Uh, but then in later years, after I had been president of ADSA in 1985, uh, uh, later on, they have, they're really their two highest honor awards, uh, would be the Distinguished Service Award and the Award of Honor. And I had the 
pleasure of receiving both of those about five years apart, which is somewhat unusual, but it was really moving to me and uh, right. really appreciated uh, that expression of gratitude, I guess, for for some of the hours you put in and uh, trying to help the and profession. And and whatever. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Uh, the Sagamore of the Wabash, uh, was that, I usually ask people, was it a surprise or how was it presented? It was very much a surprise. <laughs> very <laughs> much a surprise. Uh, and... At what, at what was the okay, occasion that you I, I, I'm, <laughs> the, I retired from Purdue in, at the end of January in... Uh, in 1998. Uh, I did not want a reception or a dinner or those sorts of things. I just didn't feel it was Did you decide, fit. did you did you not want to go on halftime or you decided to retire? I just decided to retire, okay. yeah. Uh, being in that role. If I had been more involved in the department, if I'd been doing some teaching in animal sciences, uh, things might have been different. I might well have done that, but I didn't feel I could really do them justice by going that way, so I decided just to, to cut the cord at one time okay. and do that. So okay, came to retirement, and they said, well, well they didn't want the dinner reception, but they just said, okay, we'll have just a little gathering in the seminar room there in the or conference room in the Ag Administration building, and it was given some publicity. Well, a lot more people prayed it through than I expected to, to come through, but uh, a few gifts were given and one of those gifts that may well have arrived just an hour before that from signed by Governor O'Bannon uh, was brought up here I think by Terry Stree to and given to the Dean and then presented to me at that time so it was yes it was a total total shock it's a really nice thing isn't it, it is it's it, nicely I done feel very good about that and I feel especially very good because the people who made it happen uh, not for what I did, but they, they wanted to make that happen. And, and I, I appreciate their efforts in that regard. <laughs> right. 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 Oh, uh, and I should, I should add, and I mentioned Terry Street, who did the legwork of doing it, but uh, also at that time Vic Lechtenberg was the dean. Vic had worked with me in the Ag Research Programs office, but then became dean. And so he was the dean, my dean, when, when I retired. And so he's the one who really presented it to me. So, That's nice. Yeah, That's yeah. very good. Yeah. Very special. Now, the Agricultural Alumni Association, the Certificate of Distinction, that's very, very nice. It, it is. And you've been and involved, I'm sure, at the fish fries for years, That's right? right. That's or right. pork, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Depends on how You're it is. Right, right. For, yeah. for all the years you that, and, that I was Warren here. You and Williamson and all the people. Correct, <laughs> correct. Uh, and uh, that's very nice. It's a, obviously built a strong organization, a lot of loyal you know alumni out there, and um, one has to if you, if a faculty member is to get the certificate of distinction, it's my understanding that they have to be retired. Well, mm -hmm. it, it kind of fudged on me a little bit by two days. I think I got maybe the fish fry <laughs> was, was a couple Saturday was a couple Sunday. days before <laughs> before the uh, real. I was when it was held in January. <laughs> before I actually re retired, but uh, was honored to get it that soon, right away. And yeah, that's very nice. A, uh, the uh, American Dairy Association gave a word of honor, too, in 93. Yes, that's, that's correct. Good. Right. And uh, you're a fellow of the American Association of Advancement of Science and uh, American Dairy Science Association, the American Society for Nutrition. That's correct. That's I'm, very nice. I'm very pleased with those, too, because uh, some of the time it's automatic with number of years service, but... Uh, uh, especially with uh, AAAS, American Society of Management of Science, and American Nutrition Society, it's not, and uh, so I feel very honored to, right. to have received good. all those. Right. A couple of the associations, one we were going to talk about, that National Agricultural Research Committee of that Joint Council right. on Food and Agricultural Sciences. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> this, the Ag Experiment okay. Stations, as they continue to be called, and even to this day nationally they're called the Ag Experiment Stations. Right. Um, are very much involved with USDA in several roles, but one being an advisory role, and maybe even an evaluation role, and a program suggestion input role. And one of the ways in which they do that is this uh, joint council uh, on agricultural research. And uh, so I, I did serve on that, uh, also came into that route via what they call the Experiment Station Committee on Policy, ESCOP, or the lingo there, and I was chair of ESCOP at one time, and then at that time was put on to this joint council. And we basically were 
uh, a no authority, but a, an, an, in, an input role. role, advisory role to the Secretary of Agriculture on what the ag research program in the broader sense, both in the land grant institutions, funds they made available to all institutions beyond land grant, and what they did on their internal. The USDA has an internal research system known as the Agricultural Research Service, ARS. ARS yeah. So we, we advised on all of those roles, but it was an advisory. Advisory role. Were they meetings held in Washington? Yes, they were. Okay. There was a period of time when I was in Washington at least once a month and often right. often twice a month. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got to know all the pilots and the <laughs> staff on Monday mornings and Friday afternoons. <laughs> oh, the Indiana Corporation for Science and Technology, that Agriculture, Genetics, and Technology Committee, were a member on that. Now, right. that it doesn't is that corporation for science and tech i think they've changed it it's changed, changed and right. in all honesty i've lost track of exactly right. where it is right now but it was started it was pretty uh, active in uh, the 80s in the 80s right, right to try to stimulate you know science uh, and uh, uh, partnerships with the state the state began to recognize its role in promoting uh, development and uh, economic development research development and it was uh, to help, you know, in that role. And again, largely an advisory, although really at the start we had some funds that we did allocate to various projects and proposals of institutions and jointly with industry and the state. So to get sort of seed money to get things up and running. That's exactly right. right. Exactly right. Okay. So. Let's talk about family. Uh, okay. You mentioned earlier that you people were born about the same time. Right. <laughs> Isn't that in that interesting? Yes. That's uncanny. Yes, the same it was. hospital, <laughs> right? <laughs> and those that hospital exists today. It may not exist next year. You understand that <laughs> we're locally going through some. There's severe. some changing in the hospital for the right. researchers. <laughs> right. Right. Um, how many children? And some went to Purdue. And okay. Um, yeah. I, by the way, I was an only child. My wife had just one sister, and she lived on a farm on down the road from me—a real farm, a real working farm. Which she still owns, by the way. It was uh -huh. one of two farms from her family, but she still has that one. And but we then have three children, uh, two girls and a boy. Our oldest daughter, Pam, uh, lives in Florida, in Stewart, Florida, and has lived in the Florida area since 1974. So for a long time. Um, did she then, go to Purdue? She did not. Okay. Uh, the only one of our three that went to Purdue would be our son, son our, okay. our, our last one. Uh, I'll name all of our three children then to say sure. a bit about maybe their families also. Yeah. Uh, next was a daughter, Terry. Uh, and again, maybe I said it earlier, that all of our children graduated from high school while we were at Penn State during that era of time. So they all graduated in the state college area high school. Um, Terry decided to, after thinking about pledging a sorority, decided to stay at home at Penn State and went to Penn State. And another Penn State student who was uh, a year or two advanced from her was graduating in engineering, they got married. So she transferred from Penn State and actually finished her degree at Temple University because it was near where he was working at that time. Uh, she, well, okay. And then our son Don uh, did come to Purdue and was here from 1976 until graduated in May of 1980. We paid our four years of out-of-state tuition, and then that November we moved back here. So, uh, but anyway, he, he, he did come, come to Purdue. Our oldest daughter Pam, who I mentioned, does not have any children. Uh, daughter Terry in New Jersey has two sons. And uh, uh, one of them, they both went through Rutgers, I think maybe I mentioned that earlier. And uh, one of them went, was interested in biological sciences, uh, went on to um, uh, MIT for his PhD in molecular biology, and then did some postdoc work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, with, became very interested in getting research on into practice and into use and got in, interested and involved in the intellectual property area. Uh, did go back to Cambridge, Mass for a while with a startup company that he'd worked with on the side while he was working on his PhD. That company was hit by the economic slump. So at the moment he's back in Madison working with a law firm, a large law firm who 
handled essentially all the University of Wisconsin patent stuff and others, and is the science advisor there, but now intends to go to law school. I was going to ask that. I wondered if that might. That might that he just, okay, to get return. to the top of the game in that particular line, that sure. would be the thing to do. So right. that's He'd need on that his couple, right? And I think his wife, who we met at MIT, uh, is probably going to go to law school as well. So there. Oh, that's there. good. You can save on textbooks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we refer to them to the phrase, so I can say it here, as our overeducated, underemployed uh, <laughs> grandchildren right, right now. <laughs> uh, Putting it in today's time, 2010. <laughs> right. <laughs> And then son Don also has two children. Uh, the son Blaine, named after my wife's, that is her maiden name. So uh, he chose that as the first name for their son or our grandson, Blaine Baumgart. And uh, uh, they live in El Paso, Texas. Blaine was actually born in, uh, in uh, uh, Georgia, but uh, Atlanta, Georgia, but then they moved to El Paso, which was Carol's uh, daughter-in-law's hometown. They've been there for a long time now. Uh, but back to grandson Blaine, he uh, is a student, senior student at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and is a math student, double majoring in economics, and is in the actuarial science field, and has interned two summers and has two jobs that he has to choose between now when he, when he graduates. But, He's also in the University of Michigan marching band and is uh, leader of the horn group this year, and I'm very proud of that. And uh, uh, I've had to learn to cheer a little bit at times for the, the, the maize and blue. Uh, and then granddaughter Elisa uh, uh, is, has completed a year and a semester at, at well, really a year at Purdue and then ran into some health issues this fall and has had to wait a while now to come back. We hope she'll be back at Purdue. Sure. And she may be the one that we have that goes to Purdue. Okay. Right. Sounds good. Yeah. That's very nice. Right. Thank right. you. Uh, retirement activities. One of the, that American Registry of Professional Animal Sciences, your executive vice president, right. and also that uh, Discover, Discover Competence Service. Right. Yes. Well, knowing that I was not going to go through you know, a phase out here or be teaching back in the department, and also feeling I certainly wasn't ready to retire. I retired from Purdue, but I wasn't going to retire from other things. Gotcha. Uh, I, I planned ahead, and I'd had a long time interest in a type of a conference, more the format and setting that goes back to probably most commonly known as the Gordon Conferences, but there are a series of others held around the country now with kind of that same model where they focus on one area of science, usually hold the meeting in a retreat type setting so you can really focus, not be distracted by right. the uh, blitz of the big city. Weren't some of them held in New Hampshire? They, they were. My first ones were, I attended there, and that's when I really so became. they first got started. That's right. They used a lot of these small community colleges sure. and so on, or the, the two-year schools. Right. And when they were empty in the summer, they would we meet there and actually stay on campus as well. They've come a long way since then. But it's that idea of a small group, around 100, 120, so there can be interaction uh, in that setting and venue, and also where you have sessions starting pretty early in the morning, but then a good part of the afternoon open for hiking, discussion, debate, and then back in session at night. So you got your work in, but you broke it with that interaction time. And I found that to be so productive. I went to several of those in nutrition over my own career. Uh, that I think that'd be nice to have something smaller scale, but like that in the animal dairy area. So with went to ADSA and they agreed to be the sponsor, and their ADSA foundation agreed to be the insurance underwriter. If we did not break even on one, they would cover it. If we made more money, it would go into the foundation. So we started That's a nice those. arrangement that worked out. It worked, worked out very right. well, right? right. The uh, I started those in, in, like I say, right in the time when I retired in 1998. We started planning them in 1997, but be a little ahead of the curve, and launched the first one in 1998. And uh, held quite a few of them in Brown County State Park, uh, which was easy for me. And our home headquarters office for the association is in Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, so not that far away for the staff person who came over and helped some sure. uh, from there. And they went very well. My goal was to have probably two of them a year, not a lot, but just two a year. 
and keep it within a small, what, 100 some odd? Yes, 100, 120 people. Okay. We would get some corporate sponsorships, some USDA grants at times for conferences and different sources to help uh, do that. And then uh, I think at the time when I gave that up, uh, in about, uh, so I started in 1998, probably in about 2004, um, uh, I think we were up to number 12 or 11, someplace in that area. Well, they're this week, in fact, in Brown County, Indiana, they're holding number 18, and they Wonderful. have planned for next summer number 19. So this, the torch has been passed, and it's up, as we say, up to the next level, and they're going along very well. So very, it's been a joy to, 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 uh, to watch. Very good. So that was my plan. That was what I was going to do for retirement. That would keep me just busy enough. But then this other organization, which is a credentialing organization, American Registry of Professional Animal Scientists, came along. And had that already been in existence? That had been in existence, okay. but uh, had been floundering, had not really ever had a person, all, had been totally volunteer, didn't have a person employed at any level to organize things and support it. And uh, I was finally agreed to be their first executive vice president. I recall on that, they, uh, David Ames, who was a faculty member at uh, Colorado State University, and Lee Shell, who was with Prina at the time, a cattle advisor in Omaha, Nebraska, the president and past president of ARPAS, American Registry of Professional Animal Scientists, uh, came to me and I met with them out in Denver and talked about this. and named a, you know, a, a modest you know, salary level, and they said we needed to get this thing going because they were in some financial trouble. Well, I got looking at the books and decided, no way, they could not, I could not take that money and make it survive. I said, you cut that in half, and then hopefully I, we can get start getting some money and make it survive. And it worked that way for them, but I also said I'd do it, and my wife made me promise I would do it four or five years. So at the end of four years, she went into the board with, meeting with me and said, now you are turning in your resignation. <laughs> you haven't forgotten our promise, so, our so agreement. I, I got out of that one at that time. <laughs> I did continue the Discover Conference for two more years yet after oh. that. And interesting enough, uh, uh, I don't think it ever got in there, but uh, this fall, ARPAS decided to initiate a new uh, award for have this right, Distinguished Professional Animal Scientist Award. And the first two of those names were two Purdue professors, one T. Wayne Perry, who was here for many years with Mac Beeson in, in Beef Cattle Nutrition, now retired in Arkansas, and myself who received those first two awards. Not because I had so much over the years with ARPAS, but You're because credi credited for having, if you will, saved the organization from bankruptcy, so I guess. When's it going to be awarded? It was is supposed to have been awarded at the annual meeting of all the societies who meet together, all the animal science societies in Montreal, but neither Wayne nor I went there. So they came to Purdue and presented it to us on, on homecoming weekend. Super. Here with the... What, uh, uh, so which, what's the name of the associate? What is it at the... At that, the, uh, this, <laughs> that the I, registry? Yes, the American... is part of that American Registry of Professional Animal Science. Scientists. And it's the... Um, Super. Uh, distinguished... I'm not sure I do have the title right. Distinguished Professional Animal Scientist good. Award. Very good. Sometimes, you know, if you stick around long enough, things Don't happen. Don't tell me that. I've talked <laughs> to people before. Uh, a couple other local things. The Westminster Village right. um, Foundation Board. Yeah, a, maybe I'll lead into that by saying that Westminster Village is a long-standing here, but a continuing care retirement community in West Lafayette, North, North Salisbury Street. Uh, composed of independent living apartments, assisted living apartments, and a health center, but also has some houses. They call them cottages, but uh, at 21 originally, and we moved into one of those uh, in 2002, totally renovated, one of the original cottages. And uh, it's an all brick home, about 2,000 square feet, with, you know, two bedroom, two car garage, and some porch. So it was not, they're not small little things. And, uh, we enjoy that very much, and then they've built uh, 35 new homes since that time. So we have uh, quite a few, few standalone homes in addition to the apartments. 
and uh, uh, the, the mentioned about the foundation. Well, decided to you know do some things to help Westminster Village uh, where we live and yet be cautious not to do too many things. It's easy to get too involved. But they do have a foundation. And another Purdue person, maybe it wasn't the originator of it, I'm talking about Lowell Harvin, professor here. Uh, uh, Lowell really got it rolling, and he encouraged me to get involved with the foundation, which I did. Is he also, does he also live in He, he lives in one of the houses in okay. Westminster Village, okay. right. Okay. right. Uh, and we mentioned Truman Martin. Truman Martin is why I live in one of the apartments of Westminster mm -hmm. Village. So, and Earl Butts had lived in right. one of the apartments of Westminster Village, and a lot of other Purdue Ag people. Um, a lot of Purdue people out there. That's right. There <laughs> certainly are. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so, the where I work with the foundation, I'm currently serving as the president of it for the third year, I guess, and. Our mission is to provide assistance to Westminster residents whose resources may be deteriorating more rapidly than anticipated. I was going to ask you, what, what are some of the, the, the things that the board, what services right. do they provide? Prim the primary mission is to provide some support toward individuals whose resources are running low due to living longer than expected or inflation and all the different things sure. you know, that happen. Uh, and the other residents are very appreciative of that goal, and I think that really has built a lot of the loyalty and support coming into the foundation. But in addition to that, we can start new programs, do educational things, and overall, we try to put most of our dollars directly into that support of residents, but then we might use seed money, and Lowell Harden still chairs our grants committee, seed money some things to get programs started with the understanding that Westminster Village itself as the retirement community and their board will pick it up after that. Okay. We started a new chaplain position in that way. Uh, this year we started a new uh, coordinator of volunteers. Uh, there's a lot of people who wanted to volunteer out there and there was no way to really let them because nobody to you really need, like yeah. the, uh, the ones at the hospital, need somebody to handle Need somebody them. to oversee it and train them and do the checks and all sure. those kinds of things. Right. So we're doing that for one year, and the board agreed that that's successful. They'll pick that up. And then we were involved also in actually the purchase of a particular grand piano for their, you know, things of that sort sure. right, over the years. Uh, they were about uh, uh, 20 years raising, getting up to the first million, and then the last four years we're now up to about $2.4 million. Not huge, but going in the but right direction. But you've got something to work with. Right, we right. do have some things. If, if for the resources for the resident, do they have, if you give them a loan or something, do they need to repay or <coughs> not necessarily? Uh, and, and really as the foundation, oh. we don't get directly involved in that. There's okay. the confidentiality issue. Okay. I the see. only people who really know who those persons are sure. would be two or three people within Westminster Village Administration. Sure. But they know that and this is a source. That that's they right. They know that. And we contribute to them for right. those sources. And do we don't know who's, have no idea who's getting do the it. Other, do the residents contribute to the, the foundation? Yes. Okay. Yes. Residents are strong contributors. They will use it in, in for many my small uh, contributions in memory of someone who maybe passed away or an anniversary or something. Make the typical contribution to the foundation rather than flowers, which is you know, pretty common nice. anymore. Right. But then all the way now until we've been in existence long enough, many people who uh, either, some of them have even moved away before they passed away, but have left their estate or part of it to that. We received a major part of the estate of an individual who'd been gone from here five years or more uh, this past year, uh, over $600,000. That's so very nice. Very nice. That's it is nice that, that it's that made such an impact. And even though I'm not on a day-to-day -day basis, it impacted my life, and I want to per perpetuate. That's right. It. That's exactly yeah. it. Right. Yeah, some drive. So Super. it's it's a, again a rewarding thing to work with. So yeah. glad to put That's my time nice. in on it. Yeah. Good for you. And you also volunteer at the Visitors Information Center. Researchers, this is the first point of contact when you come on campus. Right. <laughs> yeah. Two locations. You give some tours? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> The, the main information center is, is on Northwestern Avenue sure. with, with, the, with the parking facility and the, and the visitor information center located together, although administratively they're separate. And then, then there's a branch in the Union Building, uh, the kiosk, 
there in the center, right in the Great Hall area. Do you help out there? And I help out there okay. two or three afternoons uh, uh, a month okay. uh, there. And it's, it's fun to do. Uh, uh, it's amazing. I never go through an afternoon without being asked a question I've never thought about, I've never heard before. <laughs> so they're, they're great resources. Though. It's been built up over time. Sure. But there are resources right there at the desktop area or on the computer that's there is amazing, but uh, uh, they're still can stump you at times. I know, uh, right. There are a lot of places we can go and get, and it's, uh, it's not just students who come. It will, oh, no. in, the, in the summer, it'll be parents who are here. Especially their, day on campus. Right. That's a busy time and a fun time to be here, and that's when most of the tours are given. The tour guides always stop by there and pick up a laser pointer to go over to the 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 map, the 3D map of the campus and point that to the things so there. Great. So I see every tour group that goes by yeah, when they come in there. Yeah. And then other times when there are conferences going on, a lot of the questions will come from conference at attendees right. uh, who are meeting either in Stewart or in the Union Building and have questions about sure. something. Right. Everything from the university to restaurants to what to see. Whatever, what to you never know where the what the next one's coming that's from. That's right. 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 How about a favorite Purdue tradition? Do you have them? Or an, outsta an outstanding event? Uh, one or both? Uh, Any comes to mind? Not Back to really your, school, your school days. Yeah. How about the Boilermaker Special, for yeah, example? Right. Or Commencement is another right. one that people say. Okay, thank you, because that, that's something I do feel very proud of. Many uh, people have commented right. on that. And I've never heard one not comment on it in a positive way after right. they've seen it for the first time. It's just very, very impressive. Right. And even what, ones that really have carried the banner or things of that sort or been escorts, it's really right. impacted them. Or being on the stage, you get another feel that way. Right. Which is right. really good. Right. Yeah. And then you remember some of those things that happened when you were a student here. Uh, I, being married early and so I didn't have much time sure. for extracurricular activities. I was in the Dairy Science Club and the judging team. Uh, but. Uh, would often stop in at the sweet shop, as we called it in the union. Now it's Pappy's Sweet Shop. And class gifts are not that big here anymore. My class had its 50th in 2005, and we didn't raise a lot of money, but we did raise a little bit and put those funds into the uh, renovation of that part of Pappy's. You had just had something recently. Yes, class that happened. Was that, that, that for homecoming, was really wasn't it? Well, it was dedicated in the spring, I spring, think, really. But they, okay. The plaque is up there in that sure. back part there now. And, uh, so that was that's very nice. fun, fun to do, and uh, that's one of those things you remember from, yeah, spent some time in there both studying. I and, and the people I took the pictures both. that are there, too. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> what it was like. Right. Right. Uh, do you have an outstanding event that uh, you'd like to share with us in your life? Doesn't have to be at Purdue. It could be any place. Yeah. Well. Well. Yeah. I'd say the most outstanding event in my life was my marriage to my Sounds wife good. Elaine. Sounds uh, good. And you know, I mean that uh, you know sincerely. That's very nice. And uh, so we're gonna we'll get to the closing thing, and the ball is in your court as you look ahead and look back, or however you want to summarize, or anything that I didn't bring up that you yeah. want to share. Yeah. Well, I think you triggered me to say more than I fully intended to say uh, at the start. But, um, but well, and it felt coming back, you know, having yeah. been a student and been gone. Right. That that's kind of a you know right. I don't get many that have that opportunity. Right, right. And in many ways, when we did move back, I, I said, well, it wasn't so much coming back; it was just a a good opportunity job wise. Sure. And I felt if there was a job that I could do for a number of years and keep interested and excited, it would be. In directing agricultural research, because there's always something new, something new to talk about. You know, in the current, very contemporary time right now, uh, well, let me s say something about that job. You get your pride in that job by what other people do. As we sit here today, Gabisa Ejeta was just very famous, recognized very famously in, in the last month or so right. with the World Food Prize. Gabisa was in, is in the Department of Agronomy and uh, worked with sorghum and had a major impact on food supply in Africa. And uh, you know, you're proud to see those kinds of things happen. Yeah. So you, you... That you've been involved with and to see the fruition, the end, which right. is really, I, really I didn't nice. do any of right. that. Uh, it's just uh, knowing that those people worked at that place and that's what And everybody can share it. That's right, yeah. that's right. Good, okay, I think that uh, 
takes care of it. Thank you very, very much. Uh,